Welcome to Student Manager Course Development. Chuck, we're, you're doing this remote today, so we're keeping our fingers crossed and hoping That's the tech right. gods are with us. We're, we're, we're hoping that we, we pull this off. Uh, welcome from Baytown, Texas. Actually, uh, working with Lee College down here and have been uh, doing kind of a roundabout tour of the country. Um, we're here to talk, though, this afternoon about course development. Um, again, if you've been around, you'll know we did one of these a couple of three years ago, but it was on seven. This is on student manager eight. So let's rock and roll and get this party going. Um, big picture of what we're going to talk about. When you're setting up programs within student manager, the course screen is your friend, your ally, your main navigation guide. It helps you plan your programs. You define your marketing elements. Uh, you obviously marketing it, doing that pricing structure, fees, and how you're going to charge, how much you're going to charge. Do you need to track additional data? Um, it, it's the place for information you need about the program, whether it's financial, the students, uh, key functional reports, um, giving you a quick conduit to get information to your students. So we're going to talk about it today. Course basics, uh, kind of review again the differences between seven and eight if you are still in the middle or making that transition. Uh, special features, uh, there are some optional modules, some of the base modules. Um, again, depending on how long you've been running Student Manager, some of these like workshops, budget le uh, builder, pocket ledger, you might have, might not have, but we do have those in the in the box. Uh, quick reports, great tool. Again, some of the new ways to communicate with your students. Whoa, insider tricks and obviously questions. So, um, again, as always, if you have questions, chat them to Lori. Uh, she'll answer. Or she'll try to punch them up to me as uh, if they're relevant at the minute. Otherwise, we'll cover them toward the end. Whew. Lori, anything else before we rock and roll? I think we're good to go. And remind me when we're going to do that poll. You, you got one ready or you want me to get started here? Uh, I have one ready, so let's, let's go, go ahead, ahead and, and do I'll a, poll. a poll. Before we, okay, uh, let me take a breath. Lori, give us a poll question to look at. So we want to know who puts your uh, course information into Student Manager. So if it's you, absolutely go ahead and check that. Uh, and you can check more than one here. So if another staff member does it for you and you do it, that's fine. Check right. both that apply. We're, we're kind of curious to know how the uh, management or you know how your system, how you set up your uh, standard operating procedures for doing that. So this ought to be pretty quick. Lori, give them a five five second countdown. We've got ground to cover. I'm ready to go. Three, ready to go. Two, one, and go. And the answer is um, bringing it up. Kind of a okay. A lot of another staff member coordinators. A little bit of everything there. So all right. Well, that that helps us along that. And again, if they're not, if the person who does the course entry isn't there watching the webinar, uh, we will of course record this. It'll be in the webinar archive. All right. So what are we going to do today? All right, well, we told you what we're going to do. Let's get in and do it. The new look for the course screen. Again, for new to 7.0 or to 8.0, screens have been or the buttons have been moved over to the right. We've tried to give a little bit more space in the middle of the screen. A couple of big notes again for folks that are getting started in here. I'll get my thing. Course basics. The only thing required. You know, we talk about required fields is a course code and a title. And again, um, it, it, you can fill out more data later, but that's what you need in order to save a record. Uh, the two other, the major categories, uh, well, category is user defined. And you can use that as a way to um, separate out, group out the different categories. Well, categories, I guess is a good term, of programs that you offer, uh, you know, open enrollment, closed enrollment, specialty programs. You get to decide that however you want. Course type is actually a system code. 
And again, these are the different course types. Depending on what type you assign to that class, it might provide you some special features. So independent study, uh, that is an optional add-on module, and if that you want to use the tools available within that, that's the way you'd make it. Inventory is a way to use a course record as a way to track sales of items. Online is, of course, if you're doing uh, online classes, Ed2Go, um, ProTrain, JER. Membership. Um, if you are running an OSHA program, if you have some kind, Silver Frog or a senior scholars type program where you have to be a member to take the class or, do you, or that you want, to, you want to manage a membership, uh, this allows you to implement that routine. Open. Open is kind of the default, normal, regular, um, and uh, that is you can set the default category of a, or the type of a class. Um, and we ship it out as default is open. Pending. Now, when we said earlier you can create a course record with just the course code and a title, if you do that, then you'd probably want to make that course a pending class because you don't have enough information to uh, build out the course. And you say, well, why would you make it pending? We're going to talk about Budget Builder in a minute. If you wanted to put together a budget for a course that you may or may not offer ever, you could put in a dummy course number and a title, put it as pending, and then go in and build out a budget and experiment with what you think you might be able to charge or get for people before you make it a regular quote, quote, you know, open or contract or workshop class. Um, okay, workshop. Uh, a workshop class gives you the option to track sub-events. Um, and again, I don't know how many people use workshops. I'm going to ask right now if people are paying attention. Raise your hand if you use workshop, workshops in tracking classes. I'm just kind of curious. Raise your hand if you are running workshops. Oh, Lou, yep, Malloy does. Um, okay, Cody. Not a lot of people. We do have, Lori, um, we've talked about doing a special workshop or a webinar on workshops, so we were trying to get a handle on that. Thanks, guys. Okay, um, the other types of classes. Contract. Um, if you are doing in-house contracts, private programs just for one company, you typically call that a contract class. An event class, again, um, as you know, if you run manager, student manager, you can reserve multiple seats in a, in a class so that is on a registration. An event class allows you to implement that online. And again, event classes might be things like banquet ticket sales, tickets to a concert that you might manage where you don't need names necessarily, but you just want to know how many people are going to attend. So that's the event type. Donation type class, um, again, uh, on the ACE website, if you want to try to encourage people to make donations to your program, if it's a nonprofit or an OSHA program, um, you can create a course that really represents a you know, free will offering type program where people can donate money into your program. And then finally, packaging. Now, packaging is an optional module. Um, it lets you bundle courses to do mass register, offer discounts if you buy bundles, and also does BOGO promotion. So again, I know a number of you have it. I think it has a lot of functionality in terms of marketing and selling items. All right, moving on. Course basic info. Uh, fields marked with a plus are validated. And the ones with the plus, actually the drop down are validated, would be, I guess, the, the terminology. If you see the little drop down, that's a validated. If there's a plus in front of it, that means you control the data elements within there. And that's done through the code editing set of tools. Um, I've got to get back to the navigation. Wrong direction. Come back. OK. Active course. And again, I've covered this, I think, a number, a number of times, and it always seems to be kind of confusing, but to make it real clear, 
the only thing the active does as far as behavior of a course is that only courses that are marked for active are available to register from the student manager side. So again, it's your way to manage when that course goes into the open registration element. Now, there is one more thing, and I'm going to certainly jump to the demo to indicate. In the new Student Manager 8, the middle shortcut, or the, the on-screen shortcut to look up courses, now only looks up active courses. So this is kind of a subset of classes that are just the ones that you would have open for enrollment, if you have closed a class for active enrollment, uh, then of course you can go to the yellow binoculars and look up every class that you have in the record. Um, but again, that is the, the, active, um, the active routine. And there is a mass deactivate option available. Canceled courses, uh, someone asked about that a while back. Um, one of the new features or confirming features in 8 when you cancel a class, it automatically marks it as inactive, um, although you can't register in a, in a cancel class anyway, but that handles the marking. Locking classes, again, not everybody does the locking, but it basically allows you to lock down data related to registrations and payments and refunds on a class. Does not affect data about the student but registrations, the payments, transfers, refunds, adjustments uh, cannot be changed on a class that is locked. So if you're doing financial auditing and you've checked the fees and the payments and they're all clean and you don't want people messing with it, you can lock it. Um, again, that can be unlocked by the proper authorities, but it's a way to do kind of a closeout. Um, Back to clicking uh, CEUs, hours, and credits. Um, again, we use the salvation by grace there. Uh, once the student registers for the class, if you had hours and CEUs entered, they would be automatically granted to that registration, and then you take away from those, from them that sin, I take that. If you take away from those that don't show up their butts in class, and you'd debit down or you'd, you'd edit their hours to reflect the time they actually spent in the class. Now, pay attention. That's the important sign. Subject code. If there's one thing that you can do if you're the marketer or you want to be able to have the ability to market to your students and better serve them, make sure every course has a subject code. Because the key, the beauty, the wonderful thing about it is that subject code automatically goes into the name interest code set. All right, Lori, I think we're plugging along. Any questions that you want to deal with at this second? No, I'm holding at the moment. We're pretty All right. Good. All right. So keep on a roll. Uh, dates. Uh, entering in the uh, course begin date, the number of sessions, the time and the days of the week, it'll actually generate the course dates with whatever detail you put. Now, I've had a couple people say, well, what if I've got a normal class, and let me jump again to the demo here. We've got a class that normally meets 1 o'clock to 5. Is my screen refreshing OK, Lori? Very well, yes. Very good. OK, 1 to 5 o'clock. Every, every week for four weeks. You said, but on the second Tuesday, we're going to actually have to move it to a different day and a different time. Well, the way you can do that is, and let me show you where I got to this, once you create the standard schedule, click on the room use button, and it tells you, you may change the dates and times, click in the field, change the yes to view conflicting. Now note, the time, start hour, end hour, is actually stored in military. So you said, well, this third class, we're going to meet on a Thursday. So we're going to change this to the 17th. And we're going to say, instead of 1 to 5, it's going to meet from 2 to 6. So military time, sorry you guys, you have to think about this or sign up to your local army recruiting place. 
14 through 18. Now, when you do that, you'll note that it now says, of course, the time, which is what your civilians see, 2 to 6. You said, well, oh, by the way, we got to move the location. Well, click into the location box, and you can reference the new location. So that is how you can edit um, a different uh, time location section um, on the details of a class. Control F4 saves that. All right. Uh, back to back to the schedule. Edit the room use. Additional information. This is now the second tab, the second tab on the registration or on the course screen. Alternate course code. Um, if you have a need to cross-reference classes in Student Manager with a campus course, or if you want to use a shorthand code to display on the web, you can use the alternate course code. The other one is a special registration times underneath that. If you've got a certain uh, for a conference or a workshop that program is 8 to 5, but registration starts at 7 a.m., you can note that. Email receipt attachment. If you have, um, if you want to email to the students a, a t an attachment, uh, this is where you can reference the location of the document uh, that you're going to email as an attachment just by way of suggestion. Um, by best practice, we really recommend anymore that you don't email attachments as attachments, but that you put in a link inside the email uh, to a uh, web reference to the document. So you're not, I think that would give you better success with local spam filters. All right, keep going. Persons to notify with the blind carbon copy. Now, don't know how many of you do this, but in AceWeb, you've got the ability to, let me grab my toolbar back. Hang on a second here. Get my pointer back to where it is. Okay, there we go. In Student Manager, at the course level, there's a box that says people to notify. You know you will always get, for if you have AceWeb, um, a blind carbon copy of an email registration will go to the staff person you assign as the person who gets copies. You can also, on a course-by-course -course basis, put in the name of a program coordinator. You can put in the name of a faculty member. You can put an email of a faculty member. You can put in the email of a sponsor who would like to be notified whenever someone registers in their class. All right. Um, Sponsoring firm for a contract course. Uh, this is how you can cross-reference what firms in your database are actually taking contract courses by linking that firm record to uh, the course itself. And then finally, membership prerequisites. Again, for OSHA programs or membership programs where you must be a member in order to take that class uh, this is the spot, that last field, where you'd put in the member code that you have to have in order to be able to enroll in that class. Okay, I am going to take a breather, Lori. Anything relevant here, question-wise, you want to hit or any clarification? Um, I don't think so. I think we're All pretty right. good to go at the moment. All right. So, uh, back to the shoe. User-defined fields for the course. Um, remember, of course, we have user-defined fields on the name, the course, the register, uh, uh, faculty, and pay now. On the course side, they're setting on additional info. Uh, you manage these through the Preferences Courses tab. Um, this is now a picture of the course preferences screen. Um, you can turn fields on and off. You'll see the little uh, uh, check marks next to the fields. Uh, this is where you can actually uh, enable, disable a field. And I'm stumbling, Lori. I'm trying to figure out what it, There's my mouse. Okay, there you go. Uh, turning off the fields. 
items in blue are global, items in black are ones that were uh, with permission editable by the individual person or student user, I should clarify, editable by the staff user within Student Manager. Um, for details, uh, the online help guide will give you a pretty good review if you don't ha if you have questions about what some of these do. A couple of general UDF kind of notes. Uh, again, activation of UDFs, whether they're visible or usable on your screen, can be user specific. Um, labels in blue or global, uh, those are system level things. Uh, data validation. I know that some of you have done that for a character or a number user-defined field, you can create a validation set of options for that field. And again, you can display the contents of course UDF on the main tab of the course screen, kind of like the Periscope. Um, let me jump to that real quickly. Uh, this little window right, and I keep losing my pointer, Lori. Early bird fee, uh, this is a uh, window that you can either reference something from the fees area, you can reference one of the values of the user defined data. Basically this gives you the ability to look in one of these other tabs uh, without having to click on the tab itself. So that's a little periscope if you would um, inside the box. Okay, course fees themselves. Um, Two types of fees, primary fees or main or tuition fees. Again, there are two here. You can make as many as you want, uh, but the individual will select only one. There's only one main fee that would be tied to a registration. Optional additional fees down below. Um, you can create as many as you want. They can be a fee like a book fee, a lab fee, a parking fee, an inventory fee like a book where you actually track the number sold. Uh, it could be a discount coupon where you're offering a discount. Uh, if you know, if, if you have a particular code that you, um, you give to the student, they're able to, if you would, cash in that coupon and get a discount on their registration. Are we ready at this point, Lori, to hit the fees uh, question now that we've kind of bounced this around? I think you have a w w poll on that. I do. And this again. Come on, go. Launch poll. <laughs> what special fee options do you offer your students? And you may check all that apply. If you give them every discount in the world possible, that's fine. We would like to hear about it. So. Mm -hmm. Just discounts for students, staff, alumni type of thing. Early birds, coupons, discounts, memberships. What do you use? I'm becoming a favorite couponer. I'm just really you like the coupons. coupons. Well, uh, again, getting, yeah. yes. if you're trying to get people to pay attention to your classes, sometimes, you know, in the in the days of pinching money or just frugal students anymore. Um, coupons might sometimes catch your attention. Uh, and again, if you're out there and you haven't tried coupons, really pretty easy to do. So, um, and what I like about it is if you have not done them, it gives you an excuse to toot your horn. Hey, you know, the University of Mugwump offer great courses and we're making it even greater. Have a, enter the code XXX and whatever and you get a $5 discount on your next class. So that's what we're trying to do, and the answer is, I can't see that here. This What's the red? Students and staff is our big winner there. Um, okay. Coupons has about 27% of the people using it. All right. But discounts for students and staff wins hands down. Good. All right. Well, then we might take a minute and uh, actually touch on a couple things with that uh, toward the end of the toward the end of the session here. I think we're doing pretty good time wise. So. Thank you, Lori, and thanks, folks, for participating. All right. Early bird special fees. Now, I didn't pay attention how many people do early birds. There weren't that many, was there? Um, I don't think we ask about early birds. Oh, we, we didn't? We ask okay. about workshops. No, we haven't yes, asked about workshop early birds. Fees. Um, 
Let's do that. We have another way of asking people questions. I'm going to ask you to raise your hand if you do early bird fees. So again, raise that hand up in the air. Again, I see some folks with hands. Got a few more. Low, got a handful. I, the early bird fee is one that, again, very, very easy to set up. You can do it for, for whether you're running manager standalone or you're running manager in ACEWeb. But the, uh, the theory behind early bird is that, especially if you are um, worried about having to cancel a class because people wait to the last minute to register and you get gray hair prematurely, you set up an early bird fee of two to three or X number of days before the class starts and then after that date, it'll automatically drop off the list and the regular fee goes into a case. Now, here is a tip. You say, well, I don't want to give a discount to my people if they come early. Well, don't do a discount. For the, It also is a, I hate to say this, um, somewhat um, 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 unconventional way to raise your fees is that you leave your early bird fees what you now charge for all your courses and raise by 10% the quote regular fee. And that gives you, if you would, a technique to bump your fees up but still tell people, hey, if you register early, you're going to get the same rate as we've always done and so no harm, no foul. So again, early bird fees, give it a shot. One of the new things in Student Manager 8 is that you can either do the number of days for early bird fee expiration or you can actually in the new part here put in a specific calendar date. So instead of saying the early bird fee ends 10 days before the class, you could point toward a day of the month, register by March 1st and receive and you could actually really try to push people to get money in before a particular calendar date. So again, more options for you in Student Manager 8 that um, it provides. Percent discounts, again, in the optional fees, the idea of coupon discounts. Um, I had said in the earlier example, enter this code and get $5 off. You can also have people enter a code and get a percent off. And there is a way to do that. As, as always, it's referenced in the help guide. Lori, remind me to go back and let's do the uh, name fee preference uh, at the end. I want to kind of get through and then we'll go back and cover it. And, and folks, we're talking about a way to automatically accommodate the staff or student discount fees that many of you use. Okay, instructors on a course. Uh, we're on the instructor tab. You want to add an instructor, you click the plus button to add an instructor. Uh, you can have as many as you want. Each instructor has their own, each instructor would have their own pay rate. Let me get back to my tool set. I keep losing my arrow pointer. There you go. All right, we're back together. You can indicate the pay type for each instructor. Um, and again, remember, when you are building an instructor record, you can have a default pay type and a default pay rate for each instructor in the instructor uh, additional information area. Um, back to course setup for instructors. So add as many instructor as you want. If you fill in that pay info, that allows you to generate faculty contracts, agreement letters, and payroll requests to go to, pers to the, uh, uh, I guess, HR office. Instructor pay, do you have, do you pay supplemental items for development or a little bit of travel money? Uh, the miscellaneous pay description on the instructor record with the amount allows you to add a supplemental amount of pay to make that part of the instructor compensation. Uh, track instructor evaluations, uh, this idea that if you do course evaluations, you can actually stamp on the instructor's record who taught that class up to seven Likert scale ratings from zero to a hundred on how that student liked the class, whether it's tied to the instructor or more to the class, 
it does give you a place to store summary evaluation ratings. Um, all right. I keep wanting to lose my mouse. There it is. Comments tab. We're now on the comments tab. Registration warning message, uh, right at the very first one on the top of the screen there. Um, if you have, and again, if there's something that changes about this course that you want your registrars to know, you've changed the location, the fee was wrong, the new fee is, uh, the class location is uh, behind under construction and you have to go through a hard hat, you have to put a hard hat on to get into it, you can put that kind of a note in on the students, uh, for the student and the staff. Um, reference document. If you need to track a document or a uh, contract or some kind of dossier related to the class, you can use the reference document field. Uh, notes for the receipt. Again, that can be printed on the emailed receipt, the web receipt, and or a printed receipt. I mean, when, you, when we say print, we mean it can go in the confirmation, whether it's electronic or paper. And then internal note. This is more of inside notes for you or staff, uh, notes related to the tickler date, um, callbacks. And again, this is that reminder who. Um, you can put in a date and a staff member who would get a reminder to tell them to do whatever you might have written down here in the in the notes area. So, uh, AceWeb. We're now at the last tab of the course screen. Publish option. Uh, multiple uh, AceWeb offers some great options for how you might want to make those classes visible and viewable for your students. Um, again, if you we haven't told you before. Keep wanting to lose my mouse, Lori. Where do you go, mouse? Come back to me. I sit here like a screaming banshee, and then I have to go. There it is. There it is. Okay. Uh, the top three is normal, normal standard. Publish, register, allow the billing. Publish, register. They basically have to pay. Uh, the middle three, no publish. You say, why would you not publish? If you have a course that is a contract class, or a course that is only for university staff or group with some group within one institution, what you can use is the no publish option, copy the URL that AceWeb would have to this class, post that to the intranet of wherever it is your group, your group is, and they can register online and the general public will not see that. Um, preview ACE web status. Um, if you haven't used this again, as you're building a course, this is where you can see what that course is going to look like uh, when a student would would go online and actually go to go to look at it. Uh, grouping codes. We're back to the main screen now of the course record. Uh, grouping codes are typically used for your ACE web section headings, that is, under what group, finance, personal interests, uh, you know, outdoor activities, uh, business, um, the, 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 the think of it as the catalog header where the course is going to fall within. It also can be used for certificate tracking. And we've got to, Lori, really go back and beat on the certificate wizard again because I know people do certificates, they're just not using our internal tracking option. Uh, we have a webinar in the webinar archive on how to manage certificate programs with student manager and the, um, the grouping code is one way that you're able to do that. Okay, special course features. Now we're gonna highlight these because they, uh, but but they actually is they actually is there actually is a webinar in the webinar archive uh, for these. So I'm gonna, we've been talking about webinar archive. Let's let's get there so we know where we're at. Okay, so on our website, aceware.com under webinar archive. That's what I've been talking about. Any webinar that we do will get posted here. And again, they're grouped by heading, 
new new webinars, which were the most recent ones we've done. 101 is the basic uh, boot camp, beginning user, operations, modules, ACE web webinars, webinars on reporting, miscellaneous for the good of the cause type items. So again, if we're talking about um, using 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 operations, um, what was I? What was it? Where were we just at? Uh, marketing we're tool. Looking at attendance. Attendance tracking, um, and I think that it's would have be been a module. a module on optional modules, and again, I think we've got, there it is, the attendance module, so there is a webinar on the attendance module that you could go back and take a look at. Thanks, Lori. Um, what the attendance module is, is allows you to track day-by-day -day attendance to say, is Bill Clinton in the class today? Uh, Wednesday, the 29th of August or of October. And it, instructors, if you've got AceWeb, you can actually let instructors go online and record the attendance themselves. So, course packaging and bundling. Again, to me, this is one of the modules that I think pays for the additional investment pretty darn fast because it allows you to again, sell groups of courses at one time and offer some discounting to students if they would buy, again, the entire crate of classes. <clears throat> and again, you can use it for um, a groups of classes, speeds up enrollment uh, for certificate programs, and the big deal is sell more soap. You're going to be able to sell bundles of classes and hopefully improve your bottom line. Uh, the other thing, and back to course bundling, we don't mention this, but the course bundling packaging module also includes the BOGO, buy one, get one free uh, promotional tool. And again, so you actually are getting two marketing tools in one uh, with, that, with, that, uh, with that module. Memberships, uh, whereas course bundling is an add-on module as is attendance, Membership is part of the base system. Uh, you can use it if you want. It's, it's in there. Kind of like the J, Tos, J uh, Leno, Leno and Tostitos. Take all you want and we'll make more. So you can track memberships in the time frame you want. You can expire fees. You can restrict enrollment. Uh, it supports family memberships. Um, it has a wizard to do reporting. And again, the new feature in Student Manager 8 is that you can have one membership course and have different membership levels, a gold, a silver, and a bronze, uh, and you can offer some different levels of discounts based on the level of membership that they, that they get. Workshops, again, uh, workshops is a module that is included in the new professional, um, if you bought Oh, goodness, longer than six years ago, you might have purchased uh, the standard stick shift and, and, and it may not have had workshops. But if you're doing any kind of a program where you're trying to do breakouts, concurrent sessions, pre- and post-conference optional events, with these or not, uh, the workshop tool is really great for that. If you do kids' camps in the summertime, a week-long camp and you want to know if Junior wants to take archery or CSI or uh, Lego building, workshops is a great way to keep track of which kid is where uh, during the course of a day with several uh, sessions that you might have during that day. Budgets and pocket ledger. Again, budget builder allows you to estimate out costs for a class and the big, big deal is that it'll generate a go-no-go -go and a break-even number for you based on what you put in the system. The um, pocket ledger is what happens after the real world hits the fan in that you can record the actual expenses for a class and compare that to current income and it'll let you get profit and loss numbers for your classes. There is a webinar for that in Webinar Archive. Quick reports. 
hopefully everybody in the world knows about quick reports, but right from the course uh, screen, new menu, right hand side, quick reports, you can run eight reports in eight clicks. Uh, there are some new elements in here in that you can now do on the quick report area SMS messages. <clears throat> and you can have course email reminders. And what is new on this is a follow-up course so that you can, well, we're still on the front end, send reminders to course ahead of time. One of the new options on this is that you can automatically exclude from the list courses that have yet to reach the minimum enrollment. And I'm going to, let me just jump to that real quick here. So the idea is that if we go in and say, I want to list uh, email student reminders, one of the new options now at the bottom, it says deselect those courses that don't have the minimum enrollment yet. Doesn't mean that you're going to ignore them, but we just don't want to send them a reminder if we're going to call them in 20 minutes and cancel the class. So we deselect and it'll automatically remove from the checkbox those courses that don't have that enrollment. Uh, the SMS messaging, we talked about that. Send a quick email. One of the new things in Student Manager 8 is the ability to do a mass, whoa, a mass merge mail. Uh, we've always had, again, email waitlisted, email canceled. Um, when you're doing emailing to a class, you also have the option now to say include the instructor in this mass email and include the people you have in the code notify area. And again, this is the new feature uh, in 8, and it's even been new um, in the last couple of three months, well, it's even newer than that, I think in the last month, is the ability to not only get a reminder to students ahead of time. Do you see my mouse move, Lori? Yes. Okay. It disappears uh, once in a while. Yeah, well, it, it kind of disappears off to the side, and I, I'm not, whether it goes to sleep here, maybe it just that it, uh, it may go to sleep here. Uh, but that the email follow-up to students, where the blue arrow is, which would mean you can say five days after the class is done, I want to send an email, and it might be something like a thank you email, you know, hugs and kisses, come see us again, or it could be a survey that you're wanting people to fill out, tell us about your experience with our, with our classes. Insider tricks. Number one, function keys. Um, again, F3 is not used that much, but the F2 key, which is does technically relate to course construction, but as far as a course tool, maybe you're in the middle of building out a class, and um, I'm going to cancel this. If you were in the middle of building out a class, and you say, okay, I want to build another class, but how many sections of this class do we have? Rather than bailing out on your section and going back, you can press F2, say, I want every course that begins with 1, 5, 1, 5, 1, 5, F, and ACE, A-C-E, and we say view all, we hit the OK button, and we see, OK, boy, we have a lot of ACEs. ACEs 101A, 101 um, uh, B, 110C. So it allows you to get a quick view of courses even though you're in the middle of doing something else. So that F2 key is a handy one. F3 is a way to search instructors by uh, keywords, again, skills. Um, Evaluation notes, comments. Deleting a course. When you mark a course for deletion, and again, this is in uh, the new SM8, it actually does become invisible. So again, if you're going to delete it, say, up, oh, don't want it, don't care, make it just go away, it does. It will, it will actually disappear you know, from your view, uh, the course delete option. And again, you can't delete a course 
uh, if it has registration. So this would be a course that never had any registrations. There was no transaction activity on it. Um, you can just delete it if you want. Change the sort order. This is something, again, when you're editing courses, you, if you're working with courses and, and you're saying, well, I want to look at these courses, but uh, rather than my course number, you know, and this is the left, right, 102A, 102B, 102C, you say, I want to know from the 23rd of November on, how many courses are after that in date order? So you click the sort button, say I want to sort it in begin date, and now we go next, 23, 24, 25, 27, um, and it changes to begin date order. Uh, Lori, we need to make a note that the uh, reference still says number, but it is behaving as we told it to. So, All right, that is the sort option. And again, when you leave the record, if we leave the course and go back to it, it will revert back to course numbers. So we're now 102C, next, uh, 10, well, let's go backwards, 102C, 102B. So again, uh, that is temporary. That rechange sort um, is a temporary setting. Okay, we're getting close. Favorite reports. Again, not particularly an issue on course construction, but remember you've got the favorite reports tool that you can set up uh, which reports you want to get to very simply. Lori, do you have any other comments on that one? That was just a little lanyape in there. It was just a little, there it goes. You know, you, you shouldn't yeah, forget yeah, that you have it there because it makes your life a little easier. Don't forget that. Holidays, and again, because manager can help you schedule uh, when you're booking the classes and the room use, uh, skip over the holidays uh, that you can define. There is a new automatic load federal holiday database that Matthew has put in, thank you much, that you can generate the next year's worth of holidays so you don't have to manually edit those. So that ought to be a great tool. Um, and again, if you've got a holiday that spans a number of days, uh, Thanksgiving or Christmas break, uh, you can put in a range of dates and it'll automatically log that into your, basically, don't book the darn class uh, if, the, if, the, if the date is on one of those dates. Admin tools. Uh, actually, several admin tools on the course side and kind of take a second to look at those. Clone a course is an option that is uh, on the course itself. Mass change, update, delete, which is your, um, and yeah, hang on a second. I want to get my pointer back. Pointer, come back to me. Stay with me, guys. We got the arrow. There's my arrow, and I'm back to the ball game. So um, the idea of when you have mass change, update, delete, this is where you can do mass deactivation of classes. You can actually mass delete classes that have no enrollments. Cancel a class and do a refund settings. And this is kind of cool, is a mass transfer. So again, uh, if you have two golf classes, one of them is low enrollment and you want to combine the two, obviously you need to tell your students, um, 7 o'clock a.m. class on Friday, uh, we have to cancel that class, but we can move you to the fr Saturday morning class. And you can mass transfer everybody from one class to another. Mass clone, which is a brand new option, which is really pretty cool. Um, um, back to that, uh, I'll, we'll circle back to that, that the mass clone, I'm going to get back to that, allows you to clone a whole group of classes at one time. And uh, we're talking, Lori, about doing a webinar just on that because it's a cool. Student list, um, in the, again, tools that you've got in the course side, um, the student list gives you a quick view of everybody in the class. Note, on that student view, if you have editability, you can actually edit the hours, the CEUs, the grade, 
registration note and registration status from that student list view. You say, well, what are you talking about? So if we're on a class here and we click student list, we can register note, uh, grade, CEUs, hours, and the status right from this screen. Bobby Anderson, note for Bobby. Uh, and we said, hello, W. So when you do that and we close that, control F4, it'll actually put in that person's note, note for Bobby. See it, put that in the record. Hello, W. So you can do a quick edit of key information on that registration without having to go registration by registration. All right, uh, clone the course, creating additional sections. Uh, mass clone, and this is where we were a second ago, about being able to say, give me a group of classes and put in a group of classes for the next year on the same relevant dates uh, with 16W yoga. So it allows you to mass clone a group of classes. And again, because you're doing a mass procedure, as we always recommend, whenever you do those, make sure you make a backup before you do that in case you get, you know, you do, oh, Sugarfoot, I meant to say, oh, 16S yoga, not W yoga. So you can recall those. So. All right, Lori, uh, mass clone, and again, uh, and when you are doing mass cloning, it gives you uh, the ability to deselect ones that you decide you may not want to offer that next go round. And get my mouse behavior. We talked about the mass deactivate option. Uh, that is your guru, your keeper of the flame. Uh, we've said it before, we can't say it enough. There is help available, the online help guide. And again, if you're in Student Manager, uh, the Red Book online help guide book will give you what you need on that. Okay, and I'm getting back to the backspace shift. Ah, hang on, guy. My tabber, there's my, nope, that's not the tab. Too many tabs open. Try that. Ah, we're on target. Questions. All right, Lori, how are we doing for stack questions? You've been very patient. Oh, we've, we've got a ton of questions. All right. Um, can you have multiple subject codes? No. Uh, that, that's a short question uh, and a short answer. There is only one subject code field on the course record. Now, you can cheat on this, if you would, after the fact. So if you've got four students in the class, class is done, and you said, I wanted to give everybody in this class not only Aceware, but I wanted to give them a computer code or IT code. You can, after the fact, put in a, a different subject code. When you save it, it'll say, do you want to apply this code to all registrants? Now, it does not remove the original code. It will add this new one. So you can go in and mass assign a, a multiple codes, as many as you want, but you can't assign them out of the box. You, have, you only have one primary one to work with out of the box. All right? Okay. Um, what does the Gen RU button do on the course screen? The GNRU button uh, will reverse engineer course records. This is intended for tech schools where you need to have a course that meets a large number of hours. You need 100, you need 480 hours of clock hours for the class, but manager requires you have a start date and you tell it how many sessions uh, to do it. Well, if you say, I want to have 480 hours beginning on this day and typically meeting Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Friday, it will tell you how many sessions you need to have, uh, and again, based on the hours you've set up, it will calculate the number of total sessions required. So again, if you do have, um, again, long-term sessions and you, you need to figure uh, out what to do for a schedule, that's what you'd use. 
uh, you can ask, uh, consult the help guide, or certainly check with your tech on that, and uh, we could practice on a demo and kind of show you how that works. Okay. All right. If you edit the room use button, how does it display to students on things like registrations and ACEWEB? On registrations and ACEWEB, it depends on how you have your registration receipts set up. Uh, most of the time you would put in your registration receipt, whatever you have entered here in the course time. Uh, in the case of the one that we were we was at here, uh, 15A, where we said it was four Tuesdays um, at exit time, you say Tuesday from one to f uh, four, and then you could put accept you know, 921 uh, meets 2 to 6, 2 dash 6, 2 dash 6. So again, you put in, you could put in a note in the course time, you could put in a note in the comments, note third class meets 4 to 6 p.m. Um, so that would be uh, a couple of ways to address that. Uh, the person to notify field. Yeah. Does that only notify if somebody registers on ACEWEB or does it also notify if another staff member registers someone into Student Manager? If you send an email confirmation, it will notify. So again, it is both for the web um, and for the Student Manager staff entered. If they send that registration receipt via email, whatever's in the BCC will be in, will be uh, will also get it. Good question, by the way. Yeah, because even I didn't know the answer to that yeah. one. <laughs> okay, we offer course fees, free course fees to staff. What's the best way to handle that? Uh, three or free, F R E E. Free, no charge. No charge. Okay, I'm glad we've said that. Okay, you'll note here there is a staff fee assigned to this particular class. You can set the staff fee to be whatever you want it to be, more than the regular, less than, zero, whatever. But if you give a fee called staff fee, put it on the course, and now that's a nice segue into what we were trying to talk about. On the name record, eh, where's Davis, his ASWAR systems? On the name record, there is a field called fee category. And if you turn it on, and if you stamp or assign to the name record the description of the fee that they qualify for. So again, resident fee, senior citizen fee, staff fee, student fee. If you assign this fee category to that uh, person, and then if you register them as staff from student manager, or let me make sure that they are not in the class that I want, and they flip an R. We well, got to find somebody who's not a uh, uh, somebody who's not in there. Give me a second here. Uh, Kevin Costner, Bill Clinton, Bill Clinton, Jenny Call. I don't. Oh, Jenny's got four. Uh, w, I think she's not in this one. Okay, so we're going to make her a staff member. Staff fee. We're going to register her now in our 15F class, and we should see, bada bada boom, if I've got it right, she was automatically assigned the staff fee, no matter what the amount is, that's up to you, uh, because you have assigned her name record as qualifying for the staff fee if it exists in the course. All right, I'm gonna I'm gonna end on that. Okay. Uh, we are running really short on time. In fact we're a little bit over. But uh, Joy wanted you to show the relationship between some of what happens in the catalog code screen and what happens on the course screen. And she's right, we probably should have covered that. Um, but I'm not quite catalog codes in the course. I'm not quite sure. You mean like building a course description and all? Course descriptions, prerequisites, yeah, all that really code sort of stuff. We really did not cover that. And again, in the course description, the catalog code is um, 
where you identify the, the description of this class. And you can make as many of those as you want. Uh, so you have all of these course descriptions. We think of these, as you said, as kind of the syllabi for the class. So <clears throat> mastering student manager, okay, mastering student manager is the catalog code. That mastering student manager has a description, primary description. You can have a web description. You can put in a default subject code for this. You can put in benefits, materials, audience features, supplemental data. Any and all of this can be displayed on the web. You can have the name of a contact a person for this class. And, 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 and again, great, great question. This is where you, if you have prerequisites, you want to do related courses in the C courses which relate to this class, kind of like the Amazon. Uh, people who bought X also bought only you are driving uh, what matches up with what. You pick the shirt to go with that tie. And then follow up. Uh, so again, that is the catalog element. It is basically, certainly for AceWeb, you've got to have it if you want to have any description on the web about your class. Uh, which, by the by, let's get back to that now, Mastering Student Manager. I talked about the AceWeb status page. If you have your AceWeb set up and you built your course, you can click on the AceWeb status page and it will give you a view of what that course is going to look like in your AceWeb. Uh, kind of an instant proof check. Okay, do I have the dates right? Is this location right? Is this the right location? Yep, that's the right location. Is this the right instructor? There's the right instructor. Well, maybe the right instructor. So anyway, that is um, part and parcel of the catalog. Good question. Sorry we didn't cover that. And I think we're about done. Very good. Well, folks, thank you for sticking around with us here. Um, we will be, oh, stay one more thing. Remember two more things. Our annual user conference is coming up next spring. Our next webinar, 10.30 on the 20, on the 10th, 1.30 on the 10th. It's the new SM8 New Goodies and Best Practices. So, Lori, you've got company. Uh, I do. <laughs> have a good week. We'll talk to you later. Thank you. Bye-bye.